Thank you for tuning in to Dream City Omaha Online. We hope you like this message and that it has an impact on your life. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more. Well, how many of you enjoy this weather? Hallelujah. Yeah. Welcome to Nebraska. Amen. Amen. It's, uh, it's 70 degrees three days ago and freezing today. Yeah. Don't you love it? Aren't you glad that God reminds you in this that he's a God of variety? <laughs> Hallelujah. How have, you, have you been enjoying the, uh, the chronological reading? Yeah. yeah. How many of you have been, been, been following along? Let me see your hands. Okay. This, hey, lift them up high. You've been following along. Look at the person next to you. If they're, if, if they're not look, uh, lifting their hand, just look at them and say, shame on you. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. I'm just kidding. For those of you that, for those of you that haven't been following along, uh, there is an app you can get for your smartphone called the Version. And the U version has all kinds of plans. And, 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 and one of the things, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that I need a track to run on, right? I mean, just give me a track to run on and I'll run all day. And, uh, and so that's what, that's what a Bible plan does. It helps you to have a track to run on. And it's only two or three chapters a, a day. And at the end of the year, you'll have read through the Bible. How many of you have read through the Bible? Let me see your hands. How many of you haven't but would like to? Okay, good. There's so many people I've met, and I've been doing this for about 42 years. Somebody say, wow. Somebody say, man, that's a long time. But, Doby, you don't look that old. Thank you very much. Uh, this, morning, this morning, I want to encourage you, if you haven't been reading through the scriptures with us, we're in the book of Numbers and uh, the book of Numbers is, is, is a great book. It, 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 it's the book that uh, helps us to realize that God's going to lead you. He's going to guide you. Uh, as Pastor John said last week, uh, he led Israel in a, in a fire by night, in a, in a cloud by day. And the cool thing I love about this as we read through the book of Numbers is that God took it, his, his presence and he set it right in the midst of the camp of Israel, Right? And, and he had all of the Israelites, and, and, and when you take a look and you study it, uh, the, the camp of Israel was about two and a half million people. And uh, these two and a half million people, if you, if you look at the, at the space that they would take up, it's about, it's about 12 miles in each direction. I mean, it is a huge space. And, uh, and so right in the middle of this space is the presence of God, this huge, this huge cloud by day and this pillar of fire by night. And what I like about that is what it says to me is, is God came in, God sat right down in the middle of his people, and he gathered his children around him. And God wants to gather you to himself. God has always wanted relationship. That's why he created Adam and Eve. He didn't create Adam and Eve so much uh, so to be glorified. And I know there are a lot of people that say, God just wants to be glorified. And I think he does. But God's not on some, on some glory trip, right? I mean, God, God doesn't have, isn't some egotistical maniac up there saying, hey, I'm the best and I just need everybody to worship me. God's not on a glory trip. God is on a relationship trip. God just wants to have a relationship with you. I know that's kind of that's kind of hard to, to 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 get for some of us because because some of us, uh, you know, we grew up in a situation where it's it was difficult, and we may may not have felt that that you know people liked us or or, or loved us, and so you know it's kind of difficult for us to to even even fit in and accept ourselves. But I just want you to know this morning that God loves you and he is crazy about you and he doesn't just love you he even likes you come on god likes you turn to your neighbor and tell him god really likes you he does and 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 so as, as we look at numbers this morning we're in numbers 13 if you've got your bibles and you like to turn there i want to i want to turn your attention to numbers chapter 13 and we're going to be talking about a place called kadesh barnea one of the things that we decided to do was, uh, as we read through the scripture, for those of you that, that haven't been joining us, but will join us now, as uh, we've been reading through the scripture, Pastor John has decided that at the end of the week, we'll preach on something that we've covered. And, uh, and there are some really cool things I could have covered. I could have covered the snake on a pole, uh, which is, which is there's so many lessons in that. I could have covered uh, Balaam and, 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 uh, and the talking donkey. Hello? 
that was an inter- that's an interesting portion of scripture. Uh, or, or, or I could have chosen what I chose, which is, which is Numbers 13, which is a story of Kadesh Barnea. And, uh, and Kadesh, the, the, the name literally means holy. Up until this point, uh, this place that God brought them to, this was a special place in Israel's history. It was a place where God revealed himself to Abraham. When Abraham's son Lot had been taken captive by the, the, the kings who raided Sodom. And as he was taken captive, Abraham and 300 of his men chased him down, recovered Lot, and, and, and saved Lot from, from, from demise. And God showed himself strong on Abraham's behalf and showed himself as the man of war. And uh, it was also the place where, as we look in Scripture, a lady by the name of Hagar uh, was, was, was cast out from her family and, and found herself in the desert. And God came and God revealed himself as the God who sees. So when Israel thought about Kadesh, they thought about this place where God helps us recover that which the devil steals. They, they, they thought of uh, this place where God is the God who sees him and reveals himself to us. So it's a holy place. It's, it's, it's kind of like uh, what Pearl Harbor might be to every red-blooded American, right? I mean, you go there and you know that something happened there and, uh, and, and yet the demise turned into a victory. And so, and so as we look at Kadesh today, uh, I want us to, uh, to pray and just ask God to be with us and, and, and we're going we're gonna to look at uh, a couple of lessons that the Lord would, would have us to learn through this, through this holy place who, uh, that, that went from being Kadesh to now it is Kadesh Barnea. The word Kadesh means holy. The word Barnea, it means a place of wandering. And so it went from a place that was, that was holy to a place that was holy wandering. And God wants to bring us to this holy place, this sacred place. But he wants to move us on from the place of wandering to the place of possessing. Amen. Amen. So, Father, we love you. We thank you for today. We just ask your blessings upon this word. Thank you for Pastor John and Angel as they're they're taking the weekend off and spending it with family. We just pray that you would refresh them and bless them and be with them. And, God, we pray that you would renew them as they come back next week, Father, with a a fresh anointing, a fresh word, uh, refreshed body, soul, and spirit. Lord, we pray today, open our eyes. Pray this with me. Jesus, open my eyes. Help me to see your word like I've never seen it before, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Many of us are aware of the date, April 15, 1912, because April 15, 1912, 110 years ago next month, was the fateful day when people boarded the Titanic in Liverpool, England, headed for New York City. And in the wee hours of April 15th, 1912, they sideswiped an iceberg, and they went down. Most of us understand, or many of us do, that of the 2,200 souls that got on board, only 700 of them reached their destination. We realize that because we've seen it, right? We realize that because because we've seen Jack and we've seen Rose. And we've heard Jack say, Rose, Rose, you're so stupid, Rose. Rose, why are you so stupid? And we heard Rose say, Jack, Jack. Jack, I'll never let go. And then she lets go. And he sinks to the bottom of the ocean. See, we know about the Titanic. We know because we've seen it on the big screen. We've heard about it for years. These are things we know. But what we don't know is we don't know about a guy by the name of David Blair. See, David Blair was a merchant seaman that served on the Titanic, or he was to serve on the Titanic. But the day before its maiden voyage, he was reassigned to another ship. As he was reassigned to this other ship, he left, got on this other ship, and then later on found out that he had the key to a cabinet in the crow's nest. 
of the Titanic. That was the place that they kept the binoculars for those in the crow's nest to look for icebergs. And many argue that had that key been there and had they had those binoculars, perhaps the Titanic wouldn't have sank. See, I, I propose to you this morning that David Blair came upon a point in his life. He came, he came to a day that he didn't understand, he didn't comprehend, he didn't realize it, but it was going to be a day of destiny for him. And not just a day of destiny for him, it was going to be a day of destiny for hundreds of people. It was a defining moment in his life because after this, everybody would know David Blair as the guy who had the key that could have saved the Titanic. You see, there are defining moments in our lives that come our way. Some of them, they come in little spaces every day. They are pivotal points in our lives. Just like, just like in a basketball game, when, when you have the ball and you've already taken the two steps and you plant your pivot foot and, and, and you can go this way or you can go this way. Or you can come back this way, or you can go this way. See, see, there are times in our lives, maybe, maybe on a daily basis, but certainly every so often, where we come to a point, and, and, and either we're going to go this way, or we're going to go this way. We're going to make the right decision, or we're going to make a poor decision. And Israel came to that place. Israel came to the place of decision of defining moment and as we look at it today this is where they were they're at the place of decision numbers chapter 13 many of you know the story they've come to the edge of the promised land they're about ready to go in god says to moses i want you to choose out 12 men somebody say 12 men these 12 men, let me just say their names for you. You don't have to read them because by the time you get there, I'll be gone. But the names were Shaphat, Egal, Palti, Gideel, Shamua, Gadi, Amiel, Sether, Nabi, Guel, and Caleb, and Joshua. The original fellowship of the ring. And the Bible says that he came and he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, uh, Moses, I want you to send them into the promised land. And I want you to help them or send them so that they would, they would discover what the land is like. Somebody say what the land is like. Here's what he said. He said in verse 18, see what the land is like. Find out whether the people there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land. Somebody say what kind of land. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good land? Is it bad land? Do their towns have walls or are they unprotected? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees or few trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops. And so they went in. They spied out the land for 40 days. They got the grapes of Eshkol, which were so big that one cluster had to be carried by two men on a pole. They come back, and the Bible says they explored the land, and after exploring the land for 40 days, they returned and reported to Moses. And here's what they said. The land is bountiful. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. It's a fruitful land. But, somebody say but. How many of you know your buts will keep you out of God's destiny for your life? But the people are powerful. There are giants in the land. The descendants of Anak. Now, before you, before you start throwing stones at these guys, uh, the descendants of Anak, these guys were huge guys. And in fact, uh, they at the London Museum say they have a femur bone of one of these, one of these descendants of Anak. And as, uh, as they've done the, the studies and, and, and compiled the, 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 the dimensions, they they, they estimate that this guy was probably 9 to 10 feet tall. So this was a big dude, right? And they said the sons of Anak are there, but Caleb and Joshua, some say Caleb and Joshua, they said, let's go at once and let's take the land because we can certainly conquer it. But the other men who explored the land with them disagreed. We can't go against them. They're stronger than we are. 
All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. This morning, I want to I just give you one thought. And the one thought that I want to give you is that everything you need, and, 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 and this is, this is what's, what's, what's happening. God's bringing them into the promised land. And what they need to do is they need to possess their possessions by faith. Now, up until this point, they had seen the physical, visible presence of God, and it had led them through the wilderness for about a year and a half. Now God is taking them to another level. He is moving them into another dimension of faith. Because now, instead of God's physical, visible presence leading them, they've got to go and they've got to spy it out by themselves. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. Right? And so God is bringing them to this new level. And as God brings them to this new level, they must possess their possessions by faith. And they must fight for what God has. So, so, so here's my Here's my proposition to you. In fact, let, let, me, let me start by just asking a question. How many of you have all the patience you need? <laughs> let me see your hands. Okay. <laughs> oh, where's one person? Hallelujah. One, one real, real courageous person back there because his wife's sitting right next to him. How many of you have all the joy you need? Okay. How many of you have all the peace you need? Anybody have all the love you need? Let me, let me, let me suggest to you. Let me, I, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to be contrary this morning. And I'm going to say I disagree with all y'all, except for the guy who raised his hand. And the few who raised their hands when it talked about joy and peace. Because my, 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 my submission to you is you have all of that. You have all the joy you need. You have all the love you need. You have all the peace you need. You have all the patience you need. But the thing is, it's over there. And what you need to do is you need to go in and possess that which God says is already yours. And so that's what Kadesh is all about. It's, by, it's about possessing by faith that which God says is already yours. And so today as we look at this subject, defining moments, there are three things. If you're going to capitalize on these, on these moments where, where either you're going to get in and get that which God says is yours or you're going to continue to wander around, there are three things in this scripture I see. Number one, God often gives us great opportunities brilliantly disguised as tremendous obstacles. Let me say that again. God often gives us great opportunities. See, God has given you great opportunities to get into where, where you need to go and possess what you need to possess. But the problem is that often these opportunities are disguised as obstacles. You see, the Bible tells us this. It says, indeed, it's a beautiful country. A land flowing with milk and honey, but the people living there are powerful. And the Lord said to Moses in verse 1, thank God he still speaks to us, amen? He says, see what the land is like. Find out where the people are living, strong or weak, few or many. What kind of, uh, of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? Walled towns or, or, or unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees or few trees? Now, here's my question. Why did God send the children of Israel in to spy out the land and come back and report? Was it, was it because God didn't know what the land was like? Was it that God didn't know what the people were like? I, I, I submit to you that the reason that God sent them in wasn't so that God would find, but that they would know the opposition that they faced. And may I say to you this morning, you're going to face opposition you need to learn to expect opposition. When you start serving God, 
the first thing you need to realize is that there will be opposition. You need to learn to expect it. Turn to your neighbor, tell them, expect opposition. See, see, this was just going to be one of the first of many battles because this walk is a war and you need to get used to the fight. How many of you understand you were born a fighter? We were all born fighters, right? When we came out, we had to fight for that first breath because we weren't used to breathing. And we came out, we had to fight for that first breath. And then after we had to fight for that first breath, we had to fight to learn how to to eat. Come on, somebody. Some of you know how to do it real good right now. But when you came out, you didn't didn't know how to eat. You didn't know how to breathe. You didn't know how how to move around. You were, at one point, you were a baby. And we've all watched them laying on their back on the floor. They're starting to grow, you know, and they're doing this. And, 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 and then they turn over. And it's like, hey, hey, baby turned over. Look at that, right? And then they, you know, move their limbs. And before you know it, they're starting to get a little traction. And they're putting their knees up. And, and it's a big thing when a, na- when a baby begins to crawl. And then after they begin to crawl, we set them up and we let go and they fall over. I've done it. And, and, and we put them back up and, 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 and they take that first step and they fight to learn how to walk and they fight to learn how to crawl and they fight to breathe. And, 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 and I just submit to you that we were born to fight. And here God brings them in and he says, hey, expect opposition. Understand that you were born a fighter. You see, when David entered into that that arena and he saw the Goliath down in the valley and and he heard the insults being issued by Goliath. There were so many that took a look at it and saw the obstacle. And David didn't see the obstacle. David saw the opportunity. And he saw that. This opposition was a setup. And he said, you come against us in the name, with a spear and a sword, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. I'm in covenant with God. And as, because I'm in covenant with God, I know that God has already given me the victory. And so this morning as we, as we look at this, we need to learn to expect opposition. And my question to you is, what opportunity is God giving you? What opportunity to grow in faith? You see, maybe God has allowed a sickness in your life so that you can grow in faith. Maybe he's allowed somebody to stab you in the back so that you can grow in forgiveness. Maybe God is allowing someone to betray you so that you can grow in love. And and my encouragement to you today is learn to expect opposition and understand that sometimes opportunities come brilliantly uh, disguised as as obstacles. Number two, the second thing I see is what we focus on becomes magnified. They said, we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. Now, I I don't know how they thought or they knew what the, 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 the enemy was thinking, but they assumed that that's what the enemy is thinking. And they said, we can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. Last week, Pastor John reminded us that what we focus on, we follow, right? If you're, if you're, if you're taking a motorcycle class, they say to you, you know, when you're, passing, when you're passing a car, don't focus on the car. Otherwise, you begin to drift into the car. My... My realization is not only does what you focus on you follow, but what you, what, whatever you focus on is magnified. Whatever you meditate upon is magnified. Whatever you focus upon flourishes. My pastor used to say, if you look for the devil, you're going to find him. How many of you know people who see a devil behind every lampshade? I mean, they see the devil everywhere. All the devil this, all the devil that. What what are they doing? They're looking for the devil. See, if you look for the devil, you're going to find the devil. But if you look for God, you're going to find God. My wife and I bought her a vehicle a few years ago. And... uh, and we were just shopping. We were, we were looking for, you know, for an SUV. She, she wanted something to put all of her grandkids in because now we shop not for our kids, not for ourselves. We shop for our grandkids. And so she wanted something big enough to haul around grandkids and all of that. So we found a vehicle. And I had never, I'd never noticed this particular type of vehicle, right? 
But we found this vehicle, and, uh, and, and so we bought it, and we started driving around. And you know what I, what I noticed is, is after we bought our vehicle, everybody else bought the same vehicle. <laughs> you, ever, you ever notice that? When you, when you buy a certain something or another, you look around, and you see everybody else that has it. Now, why do you see? You've never noticed it before, but the reason you see it is because you've been looking and you found it. And now that you have it, you look around and you see everybody else. Has what, what has happened? That which you have focused upon has now multiplied. It's flourished. And, 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 and the longer these people talked, the longer they described the, the land. They said, yeah, the land is, is, is this and, 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 yeah, it flows with milk and honey and, and, and it's great. But... The giants are there, and they're big, and they're huge, and they're not jolly, they're not green. I mean, they're mean giants. And, 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 and they begin, and if you look at it, they give one verse to describing the land, they give two verses to describing the giants. They spend 25 words describing the land, they spend 55 words describing the giants. They spend twice as much time describing the people as they do the land. And God, what did God say? Did God say, go look at the people? No, God said, go look at the land. And rather than looking at the land, they looked at the problems. Rather than looking at the opportunity, they looked at the obstacle. And as they looked at the obstacle, whatever they looked at multiplied and flourished. And whatever you're looking at is going to multiply. Some people saw the obstacles. And some people saw the opportunities. Some of them were pessimists, and some of them were optimists. And we know the difference between a pessimist and an optimist, right? Pessimist sees the obstacle in every opportunity. There's just no way we can do that. Uh -uh, I, I, I don't see how. I, we don't have the money. We don't have the strength. We don't have the power. We don't have the influence. We don't have what it takes. We'll never do that. Uh -uh, we just can't do that. See, see, the pessimist sees the obstacle in every opportunity, whereas the optimist, he sees the opportunity in every obstacle. Yeah, the giants are there, but. And, and, and can, can I just say that God normally puts two opposites together? Is that the way it works? One says potato, one says potato. One says tomato, one says tomato. One likes to wake up early, the other one likes to sleep in. One likes the covers on, the other one likes the covers off. One likes coffee with cream and sugar, the other one likes it black. Hello? How many of you experienced that? Let me see. No, you don't have to. But, but, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. <laughs> one, one normally sees the one, one, one normally an, an optimist, more optimistic. The other one is more pessimistic and, 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 and sees, you know, the, and, and my wife and I, we fought about this for years. And I'm not going to tell you which one she is, but man, she's negative. <laughs> or she can be. <laughs> she's not here. Hallelujah. But, uh, but, but, I mean, we, you know, I would see this. We can do this, honey. Oh, no, 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 no. It doesn't work. Look at the numbers. And, 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 and so after a while, we were sitting in a service one day, and, and, and preacher got up, and he said, you know, we call people pessimists. They're really not pessimists. They're more like realists. And she looked at me. <laughs> and from, <laughs> from now on, she's not, you know, she, 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 I understand. She's not a pessimist. She's a realist. Right? She's just looking at it, and she's looking at it through, you know, her, her, her binoculars, and, and she's seeing, you know, the, the reality of the situation. And these people were realists. Right? They looked at the situation. They said, yeah, the grapes are big and the land is great and, you know, all that. But, you know, we need to understand, realistically... Realistically, these people are big. Realistically, I don't know that we can take them. Realistically, I mean, if we're going to look at it objectively, I just don't know that we can do it. And my question is, if they were going to be realists, why don't they just be realists all across the board? Because my question is, is that cloud for real or is it a figment of our imagination? Is that pillar of fire, is that real or is it a figment of our imagination? 
Did I just imagine the fact that quail came into the camp three feet deep? Did I just imagine that every morning I go out and there's manna on the ground? Did I imagine it that we stood at the Red Sea and God parted the Red Sea and we went over on dry ground? Let's be realists. If we're going to be realists, let's look at the real situation, but let's look at the real power of God. Let's take a look at the real miraculous move of God and let's measure reality because sometimes Sometimes we take a look at reality and we think reality is all, is the only reality we, 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 we adhere to is that which we see, we touch, we taste, we feel, and we can hear. And that's not the only reality. In fact, I submit to you that there is a reality that's more real than this reality. And in this reality, we have a God who sits on the throne. In this reality, we've got a God who works miracles. In this reality, sickness is nothing. Cancer is nothing. In this reality, our God can do anything. And in this reality, he can walk on water. In this reality, he can raise the dead. In this reality, God is a miracle working God. And I want to walk in this reality and bring this reality into this reality. And so, and so that's what they were failing to do. Ten of them said, said, this is the reality we're going to walk in. Two of them said, yes, but God is for us. And if God be for us, they be bread for us. I love it. So oftentimes, opportunities are really brilliantly disguised as obstacles. And not only that, but we see that what we focus on becomes magnified. And then finally, we need to understand that if we're going to move into possessing our possessions, because you already have everything that you need, but you need to move beyond that obstacle and see that opportunity, you need to realize that, that if you focus on the negative, it's going to keep you out, and we need to see the power of God beyond that to possess that. But the last thing we need to, we need to see is, is, as I look at this, God, God always rewards faith. Let me say that again. God always rewards faith. Two of them said these giants, they'd be bred for us. And, and in fact, in Joshua chapter 14, we're going to get there in a few weeks. Caleb comes to Joshua 40 years later, and in fact, it's, 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 more like, it's more like 53 years later. Because they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. It took them 13 years to possess the land. Now at the end of them conquering the promised land, Caleb comes to Joshua, who now is leading Israel, and he says, give me the mountain that God promised me when we spied out the land. He says, I'm 85 years old. Somebody say, whoa, that's pretty old. 85 years old. That, in, 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 in Joshua 14, he comes to Joshua and he says, I'm 85 years old. And I'm as able today as I was back then. Give me the mountain that God promised me. Wow. You talk about a man's man. Serving God isn't for wimps. Come on, somebody. And he was about 32 years old, I'm estimating. Because if it took 40, that's 53. He's about 32 years old. He is a, he's a man at this point. That looks at the giants and says, they be bread for us. In fact, that's what Joshua chapter 14 says. They be bread for us. And they understood that the breakfast of spiritual champions was, ob was obstacles and giants. And he said, we can go up and we can take it. And here was a man that walked by faith. The Bible says in, in, in Numbers 20, 14, verse 24, uh, in the next chapter, you don't have to turn there, but he says, God says of Caleb, my servant Caleb has a different attitude. The King James says he has a different spirit than the others. He has wholeheartedly 
served me. The, the, the New Living Translation says, he has remained loyal to me. So I will bring him into the land he explored. And his descendants will possess their full share of the land. I, I look at this and I think to myself, what was the different attitude? What was the, what was the different spirit that Caleb had? And, and may I just, may I ask you, who were the two? Say it together. Who? If I had a $100 bill, I'd lift it up and say, hey, anybody who can name me one of the other 10? Right? And, and the reason I, I, I would do that is I'd be pretty confident that nobody in this place, unless you're looking at it right now, would be able to tell me one of the names of the 10. And I'll just throw you a bone. One is named Shamua. And I think Shamu, the whale, right? That's, uh, that's just how I remember that. But anyway, anyway, no, no, nobody remembers the 10. Everybody remembers the two. Why? Because, because nobody remembers people who don't do anything. And these people died. And, and what was the different attitude? What was the different spirit that Caleb had? Let me give you a couple of things. Number one, he followed God with everything he had. The Bible says he wholeheartedly followed God. He remained loyal. The word wholehearted, it means to hunt, to pursue. It's the, it's the same word that Paul uses in Philippians chapter 3 when he says, I strive toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. It literally means to fill up. The steps, like, 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 like you're hunting something down. This is, this is the way Caleb followed God. He, he got up in the morning and he, and, and, and he lifted his finger up and, and, and saw which way the wind was blowing. And, and if the wind was blowing this way and God was this way, he would follow God this way. If it was that way, he'd follow God. He was just always wholeheartedly hunting and looking for God. You see, taking mountains is... Is, 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 is an accumulation of a daily thing. We, 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 want, we, we want that defining moment to come and, and God to show it to us. And this particular day, I'll move into a new place with God. This particular day, I'll achieve what God wants me to, to achieve and I'll be who God wants me to be and I'll, 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 I'll enter into my purpose. But may I say to you that entering into your purpose isn't an event, but it is a process. And the reason that he was able to take the mountain was he was able to take the molehills. And the mountain is really an accumulation of a bunch of little decisions that help you get to this place years later and say, now, God, give me this mountain because I've wholeheartedly served you. God, I had an opportunity to get off the, the highway and to, and, and, to, and to take an exit when she left me. I had an opportunity, Lord God, to, 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 to get off and, and take, an, take an exit when he died. And Lord, you know, you know the pain that I, that I experienced. You know the loneliness that I felt. And you know, Lord, that I just wanted to, I wanted to chuck it all in. I wanted to put my life on pause. I wanted to, 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 to get into a cave and just say, God, I don't want to hear from you again. But God, I didn't. And I continued to serve you, and I continued to be faithful. I continued to fellowship. I continued to read your word. I continued to do that. And God, I could have gotten off when they stabbed me in the back, and I could have gotten off when I got sick, and, 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 and you didn't heal me, and I, and I believed that you were going to do it, but, you, but, 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 but I had to walk through that thing. I could have got off a thousand different times. But God, I, I wholeheartedly served you. And if I couldn't do it a day at a time, I did it an hour at a time. And if I couldn't do it an hour at a time, I did it a minute at a time. And if I couldn't do it a minute at a time, I did it a second at a time. But God, I kept my eyes on you. I focused on you. I wholeheartedly followed you. And because I wholeheartedly followed you, give me this mountain. It was a man of faith. And faith wholeheartedly follows God. He was willing to pay the price. 85 years old, give me this mountain. If I'm 85 years old, I'm saying, give me this valley. Come on, somebody. I don't want to climb a hill. I want to run down a hill. I want to run down a hill at the giants, man. And these guys, the giants are still there. And he's 85 years old. And he's saying, give me this mountain. It's like, you crazy. You're a nut. But he says, I'm strong, as strong today as I was back then. See, he was willing to pay the price. And you've got to be willing to pay the price. 
It's not easy. It's not easy to, to stay with it. You, you, you start something and it's easy to give up. You, you start reading the scripture on a, on a daily basis and then you miss one and then you miss another day and you look back and you've got three days you need to make up and it's like, I don't know, I want to do that. But he paid the price. He stuck with it. And, and, and here's the other thing. He, he didn't let people put labels on him. See, there will be, there will be people that put labels on you. And they'll say, ah, you're just like this. You're just like that. And, and, he, and that's what they did to him. They said his name's Caleb. The word Caleb meant dog. And it wasn't in a nice puppy kind of thing. I mean, it wasn't in, in that sense. The, the, the word Caleb, it meant Gentile dog. And they looked at him and they said, ah, who's this Gentile dog? That he, and he was grafted into Israel. And as he was grafted into Israel, they put a label on him, and they said, they said, you're just a Gentile dog. You'll, you'll never be a part of us. You'll never accomplish anything. You'll never be anybody in Israel. Just remain out there. Remain on the outskirts. Remain on the fringes. You'll never, you'll never belong. And there are some of you that the world has said you'll never belong. You'll never be loved. You'll never achieve. You'll never be accepted. You, you're, 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 you're to this. You're to that. You're just a woman. You'll never be accepted into this corporate situation. You're just a, you're just a boy. You, you, you'll never achieve anything. You're just, my, my, my mom, when I, was, when I was like eight years old, looked at me and she said, you're just like your brother. He went to reform school. You're going to go to reform school. He went to prison. You're going to go to prison. My brother went to prison when he was 21 years old. And man, when my mom said that, you're just this. Inside my heart, I said, is that what you think? Well, if that's what you think, that's what I'll do. And I was well on my way to being inmate in 78256. But thank God I've been redeemed and Jesus didn't let me go there. Amen. Amen. So, 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 so as, you look at, as you look at this, I, I, I propose to you again, there's a place for you. There is a possession to be possessed, but the only way you're going to possess that is to walk by faith. And in walking by faith, you have to realize that these obstacles aren't op obstacles, they're opportunities. Secondly, if you focus on the problems and on the devils, they're going to multiply. But if you focus on God, he's going to be magnified. And last but not least, if you walk by faith, and continue to walk by faith. God will reward you in the end and you'll get the mountain that he promised you. Why? Because if you walk by faith, God owes you and God will never be a debtor to any man. And today, I just encourage you, rise up, possess your possessions. Allow the little moments in your life to be defining moments that lead you to the mountain that God has for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stand with me today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll see you on Wednesday night at my class. <laughs> Father, we love you. We thank you again for your goodness. I thank you, Father God. I, I, I pray, Lord, that today as we leave, we will realize that we have a key like David Blair had a key in his pocket that could have saved the Titanic from plunging to the bottom of the ocean had he only remembered that he had that key and shared that key with those that were, that were in need of that key. God, I pray this morning that you would cause us to realize that we're all David Blair. We all have a key in our pocket, and that key is faith. And Lord, if we share our faith with our friends, with our family, that God, not only will our eternal destiny, not only will we be delivered and changed and saved, but they'll be delivered and changed and saved as well. And I pray that you'd help us to see the defining moments in our lives. That, Father God, we, we will take advantage of every moment. Lord, when we want to walk in fear, 
Instead, we'll walk in faith. When we want to hold on to bitterness and anger and resentment, instead, Father God, we'll release and walk in forgiveness and love. I pray, Lord God, help us on a daily basis to be like Caleb. Lord, make us more like Caleb, I pray. We don't want to be part of the 10. We want to be part of the two. That, Father God, we can enter into the fullness of everything that God has for us. Father, thank you for Kadesh Barnea. Lord, not, not even so much for Kadesh Barnea, but for Kadesh. Lord, bring us to the Kadesh place in our lives. The sacred place. The sacred moment. Day after day after day. So that, Father, we can enter into the fullness of everything that you've planned for us. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word today. We just ask your blessings and help us to remember and be doers of your word and not just hearers only, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said amen. Amen. We're all about helping each other discover Christ, recover identity, and uncover purpose. We encourage you to explore our past sermon series and classes to help you find the abundant life in Christ. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for all our latest videos.